So I was thinking, thinking, thinking. I was asking my friend, my family, nobody, there's no such professional musician in my family. Well, my friend cannot answer my question, you know. Where should I go? Where should I take a, a whether I should take a music, musical direction or something, something else. The one night, uh, Jim Hall showed up in my dream. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's like a God, God figure. And some, some way he, he talked to me, uh, hey, go ahead, M music is good. <laughs> something, like, something like in Japanese, you know. <laughs> I think, so, I, yeah. I think everything's tucked in. Is this on? Yes. I'm the videoing that. Go! Go! I gotta get out of here with Kim. jokes that uh, and and these observations that were you know very wry and very sideways and the interviewer didn't laugh at all he says he says you where were you born mr. Hall he says I was born in Buffalo because I wanted to be near my mother <laughs> I was going through a very very hard time when I was really in the depths of you know just down and I get this car uh, and it's a picture of a Titanic sinking. <laughs> <laughs> he, just wrote, he just wrote on it, he said, thinking of you. <laughs> Lenny Bruce said of, of uh, Jim, he says, uh, get a load of Eisenhower on guitar. <laughs> probably like 20 or 20, something like that. And I found one of Jim's records in a, a cutout bin. It wasn't Jim, it was Ron Carter and Jim Hall. And I, and I, I was just starting to get into jazz and, and I found this thing, it was $2 in the cutout bin and I'm thinking, wow, Ron Carter, great. And he's playing with some guitar player. And I put it on and I didn't quite get it. I was like, the guitar player didn't play loud or anything, he didn't play fast and I was like, ah. And then uh, a couple weeks later, I, I put it back on and I'm like, well, I kind of like this. That, Acoustic guitar type of sound, it's pretty nice. And so I look in the paper, and he's playing up in Montreal with Charlie Hayden. And I'm like, oh, wow, this guy must be psyched. He's playing with Charlie Hayden. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know Charlie Hayden was. <laughs> so I just, seriously, I drove up there. And, and I'm like, you know, I think I'm, I'm going to ask this guy if I can take some lessons from him because he probably needs the work. You know, he's, he's, he's in cutout bands, he's, you know. And, uh, so I just waltz backstage, you know. I'm like, hi, my name's Brian. I want to take some lessons with you. He just kind of looks at me, you know, and he's like, uh, yeah, sure, sure, we can, you know, I can do that. And I told you, you know, we made so I got his phone number, whatever. I got home, and I still literally thought this guy was just, that no one really knew who he was. And I sat down to play with him, and he's like, well, what do you, what do you want to play? He pulled up the tune, Love Letters, and, and he said, let's play this. And so, it's in, I think it's in C. Uh, so we start kind of counting off, and the first note is C. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. And I think I hit a C sharp, you know, and by accident for the first note, similar to what I did. And he played something behind it and just made it right. I was like, what the hell was that? I, I played just the worst <laughs> choice of note, and, and he, he immediately played a chord behind it that made it. And that's, that's when the light bulb went off. I was like, oh, wow, there's something. You know, I, I, I started listening to the records, and he became this 
larger than life God figure. And then soon after that I met him in person and it was like, <clears throat> wow, he's, he's like a human being. You, know, you can actually talk to him. And, stuff. And, then, <laughs> and then very soon after that I had the chance to take lessons with him. And so I went to his, the, the first time I went to his apartment for this lesson and I could, you know, I could barely get through. I think we played Stella by Starlight and I, you know, I could sort of but he, he just immediately made me feel like we were on the same. Mm -hmm. And then I'm thinking, well, that's what he did with, it wasn't just me, but that's what he did with everybody he played with. He made you feel like uh, like we were all in this together. You know, it's not like there's some big shot out in front. Mm -hmm. I had those few lessons. It was eight lessons. And then a few years go by, and I'm walking and I see him and he, he looks at me, oh, Bill, Bill, you know, I was like, whoa, <laughs> Jim Hall, he remembered me, you know. And then a couple of years later, he heard one of the first records I did, and the same thing, you know, he calls me up and says, wow, I couldn't believe, what are those things you're doing now? And he was, you know, and he said, now you're my teacher, and all this, I mean, totally, he always would turn it around, like, make you feel like you were the, Wait, but the fact that, that, that he recognized, had, had you paid him for those lessons? <laughs> oh, maybe that was it. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Well, I think that was the Years later, I moved to New York with my wife uh, for looking for something, you know, looking for music. Our visa is running out, so I, I, oh, I need more visa. I need to stay more in states. Somehow I got into new school. New school is just program. There's an audition. For the new school. I didn't know a gym was there. <laughs> <laughs> I finished praying, and here comes Jim walking through me. Wow, wow right? Jim Hall, come coming to me. <laughs> <laughs> And he said, hey, have I met you before? <laughs> Whoa. Oh. Oh, so it's, it's, it's really supernatural. Wow. 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 And he, he wrote me a number. I called this number. Uh, we, we st we're going to study together, something like this. So I was in hell. <laughs> wow. It really was, you know. And I, I, before I met Jim, like, you know, you, you have this uh, built-up impression, you know, of people who, you know, you, you, you deem to be, a, you know, a celebrity. And I viewed jazz musicians as, as celebrities, not, not actors or, or, you know, people like, you know, a, a pop stars. Jazz musicians were like celebrities. I mean, they were like, like the, they were the pop stars for me. And I remember my, my, my brother took me to see Jim in the 60s. I remember at the end of the set, my brother said, uh, oh, go up to him and say hi. And, and I said, oh, hell no. I'm not, I'm not going, that's Jim Hall, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, uh, and, and I didn't. Three years later, I went to see him. I went to see him at the same place. It was called Dante's. It's in, in California. I waited to, to, to say hi to him. I said, I'm going to say hi to him. And I thought, well, he's going to probably be a super mean guy. And, and, and uh, somebody, some guy went up to him and interrupted Jim, uh, kind of like in, in a pompous way. <laughs> Did Jim tore, kind of tore into him? He, he, he said, hey man, I'm speaking to a friend of mine. And then I sat there waiting for my turn. And I said, oh, that baby is a big guy. And then when, when it came my, <laughs> my turn, like he, his whole vibe changed completely. And because I said, Mr. Hall, and, and he said, oh, you can call me Jim. You know, and I was like, oh, I was so relieved. But it was, it just cracked me up because uh, when that guy was right behind me, like, um, ceremoniously just came up to Jim, kind of interrupted him. But then I thought about it later and I said, wow, you know, that's Jim, you know, like, uh, he, he didn't have uh, uh, any time for jerks, you know. He was, he was talking to a friend of his, who happened to be someone he didn't even know. So. Mm. <laughs> But the guy was rude. He didn't dig it. Well, uh, 
so I met Jim because Brian almost died choking on an apple, and I didn't know the Heimlich. Well, I did know the Heimlich, but I panicked. And uh, in the LA airport, and you told Jim that story, and that you looked at me. I said, are you choking? And you were like, and I said, I don't know the Heimlich. <laughs> at which point you started cracking up and the chunk of that <laughs> flew out of your throat. <laughs> um, anyway, I think you told Jim this story, and I just got a letter from the Heimlich Institute of America <laughs> telling me that uh, like it was my duty as a United States citizen to know the Heimlich. <laughs> And that they teach, like he had researched it, and they teach, you know, classes, and that I really should inform myself. So. I was living in a group in California, and, and Jim came to Yoshi's with Scott and Kenny Watson. And uh, I remember my guitar teacher calling me on the phone, being like, Jim's coming to Yoshi's. I'm such a fan, such a fan. And we freaked out, we bought tickets to every set. We get tickets and we go to the show. I remember the first night, I forget what night we opened up, but uh, packed, sold out show. And I'm sitting in the front row with my parents, and then out walks Jim from the backstage. My dad very sweetly said, Oh, I bet he's looking for you. And I didn't know Jim at all, but it was, I just kind of laughed at it. And sure enough, Jim starts walking through the whole audience, and I was like, Jim, Jim, and he's just like ignoring everybody. <laughs> and just walks right up to my table. It says, hi, I'm Jim Hall. I heard you're, you're a fan. <laughs> and I died. I completely died. And, and uh, evidently, uh, one of our mutual friends had told him there's this kid in the audience who loves you. And Jim just, just said, I just want to say hi, and I hope you enjoy the show. And, and we watched it. <laughs> And so I was completely devastated, and just and I remember that night and every set afterwards, I would sit in the front and basically have my head on the stage. Like <laughs> basically, years, years later, when I played that same club, I would picture how creepy it would be to have a little bit of head on the stage. Uh, I don't remember any funny stuff from Lawrence's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, other than the fact that I know everybody's going to say that Jim didn't like to talk about music. I know that. He liked to hear like old funny stories, you know, about maybe like, maybe road stories or, you know, any, anything other than like, he didn't want to hear about C7 flat 9 and what you play on that, that's for damn sure, you know. <laughs> and then, uh, anyway, oh, lunch is for like phenomenal. I bet Nels remembers a lot of the funny stuff at the, and Julian and you. Well, the last, the last lunch we had uh, was was really a great one. We had, we finally made him the t-shirt. It was his oh, birthday. Yeah. Right. It, was his it was his birthday. birthday. Yeah. And on his birthday. Right. It was on, on his birthday. birthday. Yeah, yeah. And he, he, I mean, after we had that lunch, he call, he would call me every day. Oh, that was so amazing. He was so happy. But we had we made him this T-shirt. There's a story behind the T-shirt. He was walking. He walked Django, and he walked by this place called Mailboxes, etc. And they used to hand out dog biscuits. So Django knew to go in. Django the dog knew in, knew to, to go in. <laughs> uh, knew there were dog biscuits there. So he so Jim was going there. And Django wanted to go into mailboxes. So. Uh, so somebody had opened the door and Django kind of dragged Jim in and another guy was trying to get out. The guy the guy said, well, this is Jim's impression of the guy. Well, that's just fine. We're all trying to get out of here and you're just going to barge in. And, and Jim was like, oh, I'm really sorry, my dog, whatever. And he goes, you know, how, you know, the guy kept going, you know, where does, I can't believe people like you. And one of his stock lines was, I'm from a broken home. <laughs> so he said that the guy from Broken Home, and the guy turns to him and goes, "You're a disgrace to Brooklyn." Because the guy was the guy I said, "I said I'm from Brooklyn Home." <laughs> said, "You're a disgrace to Brooklyn," and Jim just fell out laughing. <laughs> of course, you know, and so that became a running joke, you know. And so um, for his birthday, uh, Scott and I made him this T-shirt. 
and the picture of the Brooklyn Bridge on it, and said, "You're." They said, "Disgrace to Brooklyn." <laughs> And then underneath that, there's a little <laughs> caption. Because <laughs> another story that he used to tell was when he was about 12 years old, I think the, he said the first time he started to discover girls, and he saw this cute girl in the, in the hallway, <laughs> and he, he said something to her, something kind of fresh, was like, hey, honey, how you doing? And she turned in and she said, get out of here, you stink. <laughs> <laughs> and so he would tell that, so we had disgraced to Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge, and in, in a little tiny font, get out of here, you stink. And he just loved it, you know, loved it. It was a birthday gift. Just, uh... Have I ever had a luncheon? You see, I have pictures of you. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. And at that, that was the first time I heard him live, and I loved this. I told this story to Brian before, but I'll just retell it for you guys because you were playing the gig. You opened with, uh, I think, the song subsequently, and Jim took this solo, and the whole room is filled with all these GIT guys with <laughs> names, and you know, all these guys who are there to see the legendary Jim Hall. And the first solo he took on this was this, so it's like, you know, do, 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 do. and his solo was something like a little chord cluster or a little diet thing. It went, bloop, 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 bloop. He did this thing, and it was obviously a polyrhythm that he had going that he wanted to, to work out over a period of like maybe, let's say, 16 or more bars and then land, and that was going to be the end of the solo, but it didn't work out. It, it got, he got to the end and he just kind of went, oh, like that. <laughs> and that was his solo. <laughs> and I just thought, like, oh my God, that's the greatest thing I ever did. <laughs> and, and, and I could just see the, the faces probably of these all these good guys with their, you know, the tapping guys all <laughs> showed up just going like, <laughs> Brian handed me this. Everybody knows the whammy bar? Whammy pedal. Right. Well, I guarantee yeah. you, you yeah. never read this. The, <laughs> the user's guide. He would lean over and he'd squint down, and you knew he couldn't see what the interval was going to be, whether it be a minor second or a fourth or something. And he'd change the knob and he'd look at me with this real sheepish look. <laughs> like, what's going to happen? And then he would just start, and whatever it was, that's what he would use for his, to build his solo. Wow. That was brilliant. And we're gonna have a ceremony. You can burn Joey and I are throwing the East River tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess one of my teachers, Howard Collins, was having a tough time. And um, he talked to Jim a lot about whatever the particulars of what he was dealing with in his life at the time. And Jim was able to sort of help him through this. And uh, Howard, my teacher, who Barry Galbraith was called the last angry man. <laughs> but Howard, Howard was so, um, Jim was able to help Howard through this period. And, um, and Howard was really grateful to Jim and said, uh, Jim, you know, in, in the service we used to say, I'd fall on a grenade for you. You know, that's how grateful he was. <laughs> Jim went to a, an Army Navy store and bought a grenade. <laughs> <laughs> and gave it to Howard. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was one of them. I love that. And I do Howard Oh, <laughs> he had this concept that we were going to do a trio tour, and he had this road case set up with his Walter Woods amplifier and a Harry Colby preamp in a road case. And that's what it was going to be. So we were on tour, we were going to do like 20 or 25 concerts. And before he left the house, he changed the voltage from 110 to 220. And then we got to the first concert, it was somewhere in Italy. This very first concert, we got to carry this thing around for, you know, 25 concerts. And he, he wasn't sure if he had changed it. So he got behind the amp. <laughs> and he's looking at it, and you have to get like a pen or something and stick it in there and, and flip back to 220, right? And then, so he didn't realize that he had already done it. And all of a sudden, he just reaches back from his guitar and he turns on the amp and you just hear this sound like <laughs> <laughs> and, and behind the amp you just see this like as if somebody was smoking a cigarette just this little, <laughs> little, little smoke come up
hotel had one of these first digital music systems and they had environmental sounds and we would all listen to the ocean at night. And, these, and so Larry and Terry Clark and I would be talking about, you know, I listened to the, the ocean or I was on a chip. And Jim went out, he got someone to take him out and buy some fish, fresh fish, which he, we didn't, none of us knew. And we were talking about listening to the ocean. And Jim starts, it was a half wall, a quarter, three quarter wall in between the, the rooms. He starts throwing fish over the wall. <laughs> Well, I love vacations, and Jim did too, and we went to the Caribbean most of the time. And each time, say, we went to Aruba, and I said, Jim, write a, a song so we can deduct this partly from our income tax. So he did. He wrote Aruba, and then we went to Antigua once, and he wrote Down from Antigua. And he wrote, uh, my favorite is Bimini, but we never went to Bimini. So we didn't, we, we didn't deduct that one. People, and you called me, I think, and, and said, if you seen Jim or something. This was when he was in the hospital. I think that was 2009, yeah. So I took your, you know, I was kind of really concerned. And um, so I went to the hospital. I, I pulled back the curtain and Jim was just laying there, just really, I didn't want to ever, you know, let him know how upset I was or anything, so I just kind of held it in and I said, hi Jim, it's, it's Joey. He said, oh Joey, come on in. He said, I, I've been here for a little while, I've got a new nurse, she, for a couple of weeks, you know, she helps me out, straightens my things and she's been bathing me two or three times a week and he looks up at me and so far she doesn't seem to be too impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that I went, yes. <laughs> Exhausted, we finally got, got to this one of those bunker gigs somewhere down down in the basement, and we wanted to get through with the sound check and have dinner, and, and there was a, a French photographer there who just kept on taking pictures, and finally Jim, at first, you know, politely said, you know, that that's enough, you know, we've got enough pictures, you know, and uh, continuing the sound check, and the guy comes back and he just starts clicking away, and he says, please, no more, you know, and it kept on going. Finally, Jim. <coughs> Remember, this is in southern France. Jim said, I said, no, N O, N. One time we were in, um, I don't know, some Scandinavian country. And it was around Christmas, and we were in the airport. They had a little store, and it sold those, like, snow globes, I think they're called. Anyway, there was one there. Uh, Terry Clark collects those. He was a drummer. And there was a snow globe, but inside, the sleigh was broken, so it, it was turned over. So Jim said, oh, this would be great for Terry. And we'll call it, I won't be home for Christmas. Out of your head. So I played some kind of B on a, on a, on a very exposed uh, B flat major seven or something like something that just to me just ruined the entire sort of ruined that, that song. And, you know, Jim didn't. She was very supportive and didn't, didn't have a problem with it. <laughs> and um, I get a phone call the next day from Gary Larson, right, who I had, I, had met through Jim. I had met through Jim once. Larry, it's, it's Jim's friend Gary Larson. Goes, oh, yeah, how you doing, Gary? How can I help you? Well, I, I was trying to get in touch with Jim, but uh, he, he 
wasn't available, but he had given me your number. I, I'm working on some stuff on the guitar, and I just had a, a, theory, a th music theory question for you. And uh, he said, sure, go ahead. I was just like, wow, this is cool. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he says, in the, in the B flat major scale, <laughs> is there a B natural? <laughs> and I, I had no idea what he was talking about because I had forgotten the complaint to Jim about this and why would Gary know about it? And so I said, well, you know, I mean, technically no. I mean, you know, the, if it's a diatonic scale, you know, no, it wouldn't be a B. But, you know, if it was an altered scale, you could. Okay, but the diatonic, the regular, that's great. And I appreciate that. Thanks. Everything's good? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. And that was it. It was the end of the conversation. I said, hey. So I went back to the gig and I told I told Jim about this and he played Duck Pipers. <laughs> that, that's strange. <laughs> the, gig. the following day, a fax comes through. And it's a, obviously, it's a Gary Larson cartoon. And it's a picture of a guy sitting at a piano on stage. And on the wings comes a guy with a two box that says, Al's Piano Tuning. And the caption is, sorry buddy, I've been told to remove all the B naturals. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting it all together. And I get to the gig that night. Did you talk to Gary? <laughs>